Davis woke to the shrieking klaxon of a red alert. After the first sounding, she was instantly awake. She slowly sat up as her head swam and her whole body ached. Telessa's voice sounded over the intraship intercom. Red alert, red alert. This is a drill. Repeat. This is a drill. All personnel report to battle stations. Captain Davis, report to the bridge. Davis had time to change her uniform before her intercom whistled. No voice message. Just the whistle. Davis knew it was Telessa's polite way of reminding her she was being hailed. Davis looked at her tussled hair from a fitful night's sleep. She shrugged as she checked her appearance. Professional enough, she thought. Fighting the worsening hangover, she made it to the bridge. She had been deposited by Turbo Lift B. This made coordination even worse as she was disoriented being presented a view of the bridge she was unaccustomed to. Suddenly a hypo was thrust into her arm. When the his telltale of the hypo faded, her vision cleared and her legs were more certain under her. She turned and mouthed a thank you to Dr. Farrell, then made her way to her command chair. She was relieved to see all her familiar bridge crew at their stations instead of the space dock personnel. Science department reports all secure, Captain. Sensors and scanners are operational. Weapons on standby. Helm is clear across the board. All subspace channels clear. All decks report secure. Said Lieutenant Commander Lisa Parks, Excalibur's newly promoted communications officer. Navigation controls are clear and standing by for course. Engineering reports warp engines, deflectors, and life support at 100% capacity. Davis smiled with pride, looking down at her chronometer at the time it took all decks to report battle stations assumed. Communications, cancel red alert, and secure from battle stations. Davis smiled and looked around the bridge approvingly. Well, what do you think of our little girl now, Commander? Quite a beauty, isn't she? Unquestionably, Captain. I think our little girl has matured considerably these past 18 months. Agreed, Commander. Davis took another look around the bridge. Report on ship's refit status. The question was not intended for any one person. But Davis knew who would answer first. Structural assembly is complete, as is instrumentation transition and testing. All equipment and personnel are aboard. We are ready, Captain. Any word from the space dock? Space dock signals all clear, Captain. Then shall we give Excalibur a proper shakedown? A chorus of aye eyes sounded as everyone on the bridge aye. broke into grins. Maneuvering thrusters ahead, Mr. Collier. Collier's hands played over his board. He wore the expression of a child let loose in a toy shop. The instrumentation he was working with had never been touched by any other hands, save his own, and he was already familiar with the designs. He himself was part of the team who installed the brand new boards. The controls now seemed to be an extension of his hands. He relished the moments now as he brought life to the heavy cruiser awakening her body for voyages as of yet unknown. Slowly the ship moved. The small, powerful reaction control thrusters pushed the massive bulk of the ship ever so slightly through the spider-web-like structure of the space dock. Small work drone shuttlecraft hovered. As they watched the ship slide past them, men in space suits waved their arms in a farewell to the ship they helped revitalize and breathe new life into. The aft end of the engines finally passed the space dock and the Excalibur was free of it. Collier turned in his seat to slightly face Davis. We are clear of the space dock and are free to navigate. Impulse engines, Mr. Collier, ahead one half. One half impulse. ETA to orbit perimeter. At present speed, 20 minutes. Limping across the system as we are now is a crime, Captain. The ship can do warp 10 without a strain. Can't we engage the warp engines now? Robin, you know we can't go into warp speed while so close to Earth orbit. It's against regulations. We can bend them a little, can't we? Very well, Robin. Mr. Collier, we wouldn't want to tax Engineer Nichols' patience, would we? Ahead warp factor 7. Nichols sat at her station very pleased, activating all her monitors. She sat down to watch 18 months of work and strain performed for her. 
She knew Davis commanded the ship, but ever since she had been assigned here, she started considering the shippers. She could coax things out of her that no one else could. With her personally supervising most of the ship's refit, her belief that the Excalibur was hers strengthened. Course, Captain. Course at your discretion, Commander. Collier fed in his coordinates as he activated the warp drive controls. A sleek black throttle emerged from the console beside his hooded viewer. Collier eased forward on the throttle. Everyone on the bridge could hear the even hum of the warp engines as they accelerated the mighty vessel. Davis felt the slight disoriented feeling as space was warped around the ship, and they were hurled ahead at unimaginable speeds. The feeling was only momentary, and then everything was as it was only a few seconds ago. Yet one thing had changed. The ship was now traveling faster than light. Light again shifted around them as the ship's acceleration leveled off, and maintained a constant speed. Warp 7, Captain. Davis thought she heard a giggle from Nichols' station under all the clapping from the bridge crew. She looked over at her, and saw her grinning like the Cheshire Cat. This time Davis had not been hearing things. Message from Starfleet Headquarters, San Francisco Captain. Relay. Monitor your clean acceleration from orbit. We'll ignore a breach of soul system navigational regulations. Safe voyage, and may the wind be at your back. Signed, Jordan Theodore, Admiral Starfleet Senior Chief of Staff. Acknowledge message and send my regards to the Admiral. She paused to gaze at the main viewing screen. Put me on interest ship intercom. <coughs> Attention all crew. We are away from Earth orbit and are heading out of the solar system. All crew will coordinate testing of equipment and instruments with their department heads that will in turn coordinate with first officer and communications officer. At 1200 hours, 2 hours from now, there will be another drill and other surprise drills later this afternoon. The last drill was excellent, I might add, only 3 seconds above the record which is held by the USS Enterprise. Just because she's the fleet's flagship does not mean she has to hold the record battle station's drill. I'm sure we can shave off those three seconds, if not more. Davis out. Davis gave Lisa a cut-off gesture and the connection closed. Lieutenant Sky, prepare to alter course. Bring us 75 degrees starboard, course 45.92. Prepare for evasive maneuvering drill. Aye aye, Captain. Captain's log, stardate, 8407.10. Three hours since leaving space dock. The ship's performances, by crew's opinion, excellent. After our shakedown cruise is completed, we will report to Starbase 11 for assignment. Davis relaxed into the soft cushions of her command chair. It was early evening now. She had since called three battle stations drills which got better and better each time. The first testing of the subspace radio was the message to Starfleet Command that the Excalibur had since broken the Enterprise Battle Station's drill record and then broke the succeeding two afterward. The warp engines were field tested up to warp 10, much to the delight of engineer Robin Nichols. The new equipment was a dream to work with, and the Excalibur crew never wanted to wake up. The day was winding down now. The day had been long and Davis was about to order the beta shift on duty so Alpha Shift could get some rest. Telessa was still at her new sensors. Suddenly she got a weak image on her radiation scanners. Captain, I am reading something strange. Captain, deflectors just activated. Some sort of metallic contact across our path. Science officer, analysis. Fascinating was all she said as she trained all her sensors on the object. Davis kept her silence, knowing Telessa would speak when she formulated enough data. The seconds dragged on. Object is a spacecraft of unknown origin, configuration unknown, drive unknown, made of an unknown substance, and emitting a rather high concentration of unknown radiation. Commander, that's a hell of a lot of unknowns. You have the most up-to-date sensors in Starfleet, and you can't give me any information on this unknown spacecraft. The sensors do not recognize any of the data it is receiving. 
I can tell you that it is perfectly round. Diameter, 300 meters. Circumference, 942 meters. Collier, give me visual on the craft. What appeared on the screen was simply a bright luminescent globe, with no apparent openings, ports, or anything suggesting any propulsion units. Report on vessel's position and status. Vessel is now matching our speed at warp 7. Holding at one light second distance. Friendly little thing, isn't she? Communications, you reading anything from her? Captain, not picking up a peep. Well, if they won't speak up, let us do the talking. Open hailing frequencies and tie in the universal translator. Ready? Attention unidentified ship, this is Captain Kelly L. Davis, commanding the United Starship Excalibur. Please acknowledge and identify. Captain, nothing. Science officer, can you at least pinpoint any life forms on the ship? Negative. The unknown drive is making sensor scans of the interior unintelligible. On board the glowing orb, something stirred. The alien pentagon-shaped bridge was deserted. The several consoles in the raised center command chair were covered with a fine layer of undisturbed dust. The life supports had been deactivated by whatever disaster had befallen the ship. But somehow the dust on the command chair suddenly swirled away to flow to the deck. Something was on the derelict vessel, something without substance, something definitely not alive. A switch on the chair's arm suddenly snapped on and power flowed through the chair for the first time in years. Telessa's eyebrow went up and she almost smiled when the first reading her sensors could translate appeared. Captain, sensors are picking up a power surge. Some sort of equipment activated aboard the vessel. Collier, could it be an automated defense system? Negative as far as I can tell. However, my sensors are only programmed to identify known weaponry systems. Captain, I'm getting a signal from the vessel. It's in a language even, the Universal Translator has no record of. It is repeating itself at regular intervals. Commander, transfer to my console. It is indeed repeating itself. Undoubtedly a pre-recorded message. The library computer is running comparisons with all known languages. Minutes passed like hours. Davis wondered if the computers on Excalibur ever advanced at all. Every duotronic computer seemed to correlate important data at the same rate, slow. Finally, a single word appeared on the screen in front of Telesa. Help. Captain, it is the only part of the message that the computer could decipher. Mr. Sky, what is the projected course of the alien spacecraft? Sky hit several controls on his board then projected his data on the main viewing screen. A view of sectors 32, 33, and 34 appeared. Excalibur was represented by a blue dot, the alien a red. Suddenly the red dot stretched outward as a red line. The red line intersected a solar system in sector 34. If it maintains its present course and speed, it will enter the star base 11's solar system in approximately 7 hours. Put the star base 11 system upon the main screen and project the alien spacecraft's course through it. The system enlarged filling the screen and the red line continued its journey. Davis frowned when the line collided with star base 11. The screen then zoomed in on the view of the planet which hosted the starbase. Several large satellites were included in the view. The red line ended its journey by hitting one of the satellites. Telesa, please identify the satellites orbiting the starbase. The satellites orbiting Starbase 11 are Starfleet Transporter Relay Stations, Zero Gravity Intensive Care Hospitals, and Independent Civilian Research Stations. The particular station that the alien spacecraft will collide with is a hospital established when the planet was set up as a starbase. Telesa, can we tractor beam the alien ship? Negative. At its present speed, it would undoubtedly overload the tractor field and lead to severe structural damage to the alien vessel as well as to Excalibur. What about moving the hospital station to a different orbit? The station has no maneuvering capability. It is over 20 years old and placed in a permanent Lagrangian orbit. The designers foresaw no need to have it moved. 
Due to the size and bulk, it would require the tractor beams of at least two Starship-class vessels to move it sufficiently out of danger. Tilesa, let me guess. There are no ships of our class currently docked at Starbase 11. Telesa read from her hooded viewer and looked at her captain in puzzlement. Captain, correct. How would you be privy to the Starbase's dock status? Murphy's Law? Read up on it after this mess is cleared up. Captain, why can't we destroy it? Because we have no way of knowing whether it is has a crew aboard. Collier, can we somehow knock it off course with a phaser shot without destroying it? We have no way of knowing the extent of their shielding if they have any at all. A single low power shot could very well destroy it or damage it beyond repair. Any suggestions? Could we possibly beam over and attempt to alter its course from within? Robin, you're thinking like a curious kid. Think like a Starfleet officer instead. You'd be beaming over blind. Kelly, can you blame me? No known propulsion or power source. Just think of what this could mean to the Federation if we bring back new and better technology. I agree with the engineer. The dangers, if any, are far outweighed by the possibilities for technological advance. This new drive could be an invaluable asset to the Federation. All right, all right, I'll beam over with a medical volunteer and take a look around. Telesa's raised eyebrow conveyed her amusement at her captain. Captain, Engineer Nichols and I accept the risk and should be the ones to beam over. The medical volunteer I agree with, but your presence would only be an unwarranted gamble. No disrespect intended, your technical capabilities aside, Lieutenant Commander Nichols and myself are more qualified for a mission of this nature. Kelly, Talisa and I want to do this. Don't risk your neck to spare us from risking ours. Oh, all right. I give up. Report to the transporter room in 10 minutes in full environmental suits. On the alien vessel, three golden forms coalesced then solidified into existence on the dark and alien bridge. The lights connected to their environmental suits helmets helped light the dimness. Dr. Farrell scanned the area with her recorder as Telesa and Nichols surveyed the silent and dust-covered consoles. Everything is dead over here. Telesa, find anything resembling navigational equipment? Negative. The command chair's blinking light caught her eye. She ascended the steps and switched the activated button off. The chair went dead as power left it. She noted the absence of dust on the seat of the large cushioned chair as well as the chair's arm. To the rear of the arm, a small panel was opened and another button activated inside. She switched the button to what she believed was the off position. She looked for any more activated switches, found none, and then opened her communicator channel to the ship. Excalibur, are you still receiving the automated message? Commander, negative. It stopped just a few seconds ago. I deactivated all the switches on the command chair's console. The signal could have been activated automatically or manually. There is no way of telling. We will continue our search. Telesa out. Telesa adjusted her communicator, switching it to the suit to suit channel. Dr. Farrell, are you picking up any life forms? Telesa, I can't tell. There's enough loose radiation in the corridors to kill the entire crew of the Excalibur. It's messing up my scans. If there is life, they have an awfully high tolerance to hard radiation. Perhaps you are correct. Their metabolisms might not be affected by it. We're not so lucky. Our metabolisms are being affected. Our environmental suits will protect us for a little while, but I wouldn't recommend us staying here too long. What is our time factor? Nothing too critical. We can afford to stay 24 hours, at the most, before the radiation starts getting through our suit's shielding. Engineer Nichols, can you make any sense of the bridge consoles? This panel on the console directly behind and below the command chair seems to be the engineering console, but I can't bridge any power. A few monitors show power levels on the ship are still on. The engines are running at 80% power consumption. 
Most of the other ship systems are deactivated. I'd be able to locate the power source if the board was activated. Telesa stepped up to the command chair small steps and brought her silver form into the seat. It was a very pleasant seat, high above all the other stations. She put pleasantries aside and went to task scanning the workings of the chair. After a few moments she hit a series of switches. The whole bridge flared into life. Nichols experimentally hit several switches one at a time. After the third, the bridge's lights went on. Every corner was illuminated, including the turbo lift-like doors to the right of the command chair. Symbolized on the doors was a single red arrow pointing down. Talisa, power source located. It's on the eighth deck below this one. It's big too. It takes up a good percentage of seven decks. I'll check it out. I'll tag along. Maybe we can find some DLI below decks. Telesa walked up to the door. Unlike the Excalibur's lift doors, these did not yield and open. Dr. Farrell noticed the crystal-like object, hand level on the wall next to the doors. She went to touch it. Before her hand reached it, it glowed yellow. The doors opened seconds later. Without a word, they entered. Telesa could not read the various writing on the controls of the lift. However, the controls were very intuitive. Below assorted writings were simple buttons, and beside each button a series of dots. Telesa pushed the button with eight dots, and the lift descended. After riding the car for a few moments, it stopped. Telesa walked onto the deck in which the lift deposited them. Telesa, I'll go lower. Survivors aren't probably going to hang around the power plant decks. They'd be somewhere they can get food and medical attention. I'll meet you on the bridge later. All right, just check in with Engineer Nichols every 10 minutes. I'll do the same. Dr. Farrell nodded and let the doors shut. Telesa could hear the machinery as the car descended even more. She walked through the deserted corridor with her recorder leading her to the power source located by Nichols. She entered the first door she saw. After waving her hand in front of the entry crystal on the wall, her eyes widened. The room was three times the size of the shuttlecraft room on the Excalibur. It continued three decks up and three decks below. Telesa stood on an observation ledge on the center deck. In the room's center sat a huge globe. It resembled the ship itself except for the hundreds of cables leading from its surface and disappearing into bulkheads. The globe itself was red and was throbbing with a deep regular sound. Scientific art took over where astonishment left off. She started to scan the object instead of letting its physical size and appearance overwhelm her. If she was to do anything to change the course of this ship, or bring its technological aspects to the Federation, she had to understand its operation first. She caught movement from the corner of her eye. She whirled to see the dust on the ledge swirl into the air then slowly settle down. She looked around to see what could have caused the swirling dust. She whirled around again to see another similar display of the dust, drawing her phaser. She slowly surveyed the area. She opened her communicator channel. Engineer Nichols, please acknowledge. Nichols here. Are you observing any disturbances on the bridge? What kind of disturbances? Twice now. The dust on the deck near me has shot into the air, then settled, as if disturbed by movement, where no movement was observed. Could the life support be coming on? The ventilators could be releasing spurts of air. Negative. My tricorder would have registered it. I'll investigate further. Teresa, where are you? I'm coming down to you. Negative. Stay where you are. The situation is not dangerous at present. Even if it were, it would be illogical to endanger both of us, rather than just one. If you do not receive my signals every five minutes, then beam back to the Excalibur. What is Dr. Farrell's status? She found what she believes is a sick bay. So far she hasn't figured out any of the equipment, but she did find a whole lot of bodies in what she believes are stasis boxes. She'd like to beam over one of the bodies for an autopsy, but she can't get into the stasis boxes. Tell Dr. Farrell not to disturb them as of yet. They could be booby-trapped, and she could get herself seriously injured. I'll contact you in five minutes, TLS out. 
Switching the communicator off, she relaxed her grip on her phaser. Maybe it was the ventilators after all. She could have missed it when scanning. She worked over to the ledge's railing, and switched her recording to another disc inside the tricorder. She did not want to overload the disc in fear of losing valuable data. Suddenly the inches of dust from all around her swirled into the air forming a cloud which she could not see through. Something grabbed at Alessa's arm. The touch of the unknown assailant was rough and cold. A cold wind seemed to blow right through Telessa's body. Her grip on her phaser was broken, and it fell to the deck. Her tricorder strap was ripped from her shoulder and it too fell. Her body was pushed against the railing. The years old material weakened, and gave way under her weight. Telessa's scream went unheard as she fell over the ledge to hit the deck below. From the deck above where she fell, the swirling dust cloud seemed to take on the shape of a humanoid before it settled back onto the deck. On the bridge, Nichols was making more progress on deciphering the controls on each of the alien consoles. She ran a simulation on her tricorder, then touched the sequence on the console. After the last button was pressed, the lights on the bridge dimmed, and all but failed. She plugged her recorder into the console to translate the data which was in the strange alien language. Nichols activated her communicator. Excalibur, you should be reading a power reduction in the alien engines. Can you confirm? Commander, affirmative. Sensors show a definite power loss in the unknown drive. What is our current speed now, Lieutenant? Speed is down to warp 5 and decelerating rapidly. You should be at zero acceleration in 30 seconds. Good. As far as my tricorder can decipher from the alien engineering board, I succeeded in deactivating the ship's main power source. Any theories as to the internal function of that power source or the engines? Negative. But one thing I can tell you is that our matter antimatter process is by far superior in every way. The power plant itself is huge. The main assembly takes up seven decks and most of the ship. 75% of the vessel is devoted to the production of ship's power. How about navigation? Any progress there? I haven't had the time to look over any other consoles. There is one which is smashed and looks beyond use. What were you saying about Murphy's Law before? I'm hoping it's not the navigational console. To be able to fly the alien ship into Starbase 11's orbit with an Excalibur crew aboard would be a nice way to top off our shakedown cruise. Have you found any sign of life on the ship? Negative. It looks as if the ship's a derelict. The radiation from the engines is clearing. We are trying a sensor scan of the entire ship. Please hold. Radiation is still playing havoc with the sensors. We won't be able to make accurate scan some hours yet. We'll beam you three back and send over a salvage team. Kelly, I'd like to stay aboard. I already understand the controls marginally. I'd be a help to the team. Very well, have Tila and the doctor to signal when they are ready for transport. Davis out. <laughs>